Foxborough Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this public meeting of the board, including the public hearing that the board is scheduled to, to conduct to order. In accordance with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, executive order of March 12, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, we are conducting this meeting virtually by Zoom. Public comments this evening will be accepted during the public hearing. To offer comments by Zoom, you'll be asked to use the button in Zoom that is labeled raise hand. This will alert us that you wish to speak. We will individually bring you into the meeting. If you are planning to speak tonight, you may wanna take a moment to find the Zoom button, make sure that you are in a quiet space and have a working microphone. Also, please be sure that your Zoom window includes your name. If you are participating by phone, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine. If you will not be speaking tonight, we recommend and request that you not use Zoom, but instead watch this meeting on Foxborough Cable Access, by cable television, their YouTube channel, or Facebook Live. In the event of any technical <coughs> difficulties, matters on our agenda that cannot be considered automatically will be continued to the board's next meeting. That meeting currently is scheduled for February 18, 2021. All votes that we take tonight will be done by roll call. At this time, I wish to recognize the other members of the board, David Brown, Kimberly Mellon, I guess Kurt is not here. No, nope, I don't see Kurt, and Lorraine Brew. Finally, I wish to recognize Diana Gray, the board's administrative assistant, and Barry Ringler, the town of Foxborough's building commissioner and zoning enforcement officer. Tonight is a first for the board in several respects. It's the first time that Mr. Ringler, who is the town's new building commissioner and zoning enforcement officer has joined us. And we welcome Barry you know, to our zoning board team. It's also the first time that we have conducted a meeting entirely remotely by Zoom. And to my understanding, this is the first, or this will be the first public hearing that the town has conducted by, by Zoom. I know that the board of uh, the planning board and the board of selectmen have met by Zoom, but to my knowledge, they have not done so with respect to a public hearing. Uh, the planning so board actually as, did. I'm sorry, they did. <laughs> the oh, yeah, yeah the solar one. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, regardless, so second. This, is, this is the first for us. <laughs> so I would request um, the patience of all concerned. It now being 7 p.m., Stephanie Silby seeks a variance pursuant to section 4.14 of the Code of the Town of Foxborough, Massachusetts, Chapter 275 Zoning as well as any other required special permits, findings, and or variances to allow the existing garage to be converted into a second residential dwelling structure on the property located at 15 Baker Street in the R15 residential and agricultural district. The property is also located within the historic district. Uh, just a couple of um, housekeeping items. First, there is an error in the um, hearing notice it's not section 4.14, it's 4.1.4. Um, that uh, I will refer to the section though tonight as 414, but again, the correct section is 4.1.4, not 4.14. Second, I submitted a disclosure notice to the uh, town clerk um, earlier today in which I indicated that I have had two telephone conversations with the attorney representing the applicant in this matter, the first of which was a month before it was filed. No statement was made by me during such conversations as to how I might vote in this matter, nor an information that might persuade me to vote in a certain manner. And I indicated that, you know, taking into, the, into account the facts that I've disclosed, I feel that I can perform my official duties objectively and fairly. Finally, we're, we're a board of five members. And again, Mr. Yegian right now is not with us. So there are four of us here. All of us are entitled to and will participate in the public hearing itself. However, only three of us in accordance with state law are authorized to vote. And typically the individuals who vote are the regular board members. And that's David Brown, Kim Mellon, and me. If one of us is absent or if one of us has to recuse him or herself, then one of the associate members 
he's authorized to sit in that person's uh, place and to vote on the matter. So again, the four of us are here. And if Mr. Yegi enjoys, joins us, we'll all be authorized, all are authorized to participate in this matter. Oh, but Kurt's coming David, now. He's, he's coming now? Yep. But only David, Kim, and Lorraine are authorized and will be voting. And that's on all matters relative to the uh, public hearing. Mm -hmm. You meant Dave, Kim, and Barney? I'm sorry, yeah, Dave, Kim, and Barney. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, this is the first we've done. Um, Frank, if you're ready, or whenever you're ready, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the applicant is uh, Stephanie Silvey, who is one of the owners of the property at 15 Baker Street. Uh, 15 Baker Street is uh, located in the R15 zoning district and is also within the historic district. Uh, the lot is approximately 22,730 square feet, which is roughly half an acre. The lot contains a single family residential dwelling and a barn. Uh, both the um, dwelling and the barn were both constructed around 1950s or so, I'm sorry, 1850s. So it's a very historic uh, building, uh, both of them. The house contains um, approximately 2,975 square feet of living area um, amongst three floors and meets all the zoning uh, requirements with regard to frontage and uh, front yard, side yard, rear yard uh, requirements. Uh, the barn is two stories and it's very unfinished. It does not have a basement. Actually below uh, the flo first floor, um, which you would call a basement, you access from the back and it's all dirt underneath. It actually clicks uh, a good amount of water um, because it's the low point uh, within that area of the lot, not the whole lot. Um, the barn is uh, approximately 25 feet uh, by 31 feet, uh, or approximately 775 square feet per floor. Again, uh, there are two stories here. It, uh, it has not been used as a garage per se. Nobody parks cars in there currently. And my understanding is the former owner didn't either. Uh, there's a lip actually on the two doors that face the um, street, so they really don't use it. The barn is a pre-existing non-conforming structure uh, because its side yard is just over 11 feet from um, the lot line where 15 feet is required. So again, the side yard is 11.2 feet uh, where 15 feet is uh, required. What the applicant wants to do is to uh, convert the barn into a second residential uh, dwelling unit. Uh, they want to use it um, as a second dwelling unit. Um, under the um, chapter 275 zoning of the code of Foxboro, specifically under section 3.0, which is the use regulations, is table 3-1, table of uses. Underneath that there's group G residential single family dwellings and two family dwellings. Uh, both of those are permitted by right within the R15 uh, zone uh, because they are denoted with the symbol Y, which means permitted. Uh, within section three, uh, 3.1.1 states that a use listed in the table of use regulations is permitted as of right in any district under which it is donated by the letter Y subject to such restrictions as may be specified elsewhere in the bylaws. So again, single family dwellings are allowed in the R15 zoning district, but they're subject to restrictions uh, which are stated elsewhere in the bylaws. Um, with regard to the historic district, which is chapter 145 uh, in the code um, under uh, section 145-7, it states that no building or structure or part thereof within the district shall be constructed or altered in any way that affects the exterior architectural features as visible from a public way unless the historic district commission shall first have issued a certification certificate um, with respect to such construction or alterations. Therefore, no alterations uh, can be done to either the residence 
or the barn, which are visible from the street without getting their approval. Um, under the existing zone, zoning bylaw and has been allowed previously, the owners of the house could connect uh, by um, uh, putting an addition on the house, could connect the house to the barn. And they can do that uh, by right, by connecting the two uh, structures together by some type of addition, it now becomes um, one structure. And with, with one structure, you could, in the R15 zoning district, you can have two dwellings within one structure, again, a two family by right. So again, what they could do is do an addition, connect the two structures, uh, make it one structure, and by right, convert the barn into a second dwelling unit. And this has been done previously uh, within the town at uh, different locations. The owners though would rather not connect the house and barn. Um, one of the main reasons they're doing it is because of the look, the aesthetics of connecting it uh, would take away from its historic uh, perspective. They like to keep uh, the historic context with regard to the house and the barn as is. Um, uh, they feel that the original characteristics, characteristics and architecture of the two buildings would be lost with any kind of addition that would they put we put up and prefer to not have to connect it and again leave both structures um, as is modifying the inside but keeping the exterior um, as is uh, again with any changes or approval uh, required from the commission. Uh, so as the chairman indicated, uh, we're asking for uh, a, spare, a variance from section 4.1.4, which states only one dwelling structure shall be located on a lot unless otherwise expressly permitted by these bylaws. And um, section 4.0 is the dimensional requirements within zoning. So because of 4.1.4, you can only have one dwelling unit per lot. So therefore, a variance is required if we want to convert the barn into a second dwelling unit uh, without connect, uh, connecting it. Now, um, within your packet, there should have been a letter from the Tom Krause, chairman of the Foxborough Historic uh, District Commission. Uh, dated December 20th, uh, 2020, from the owners to the property owners, uh, stating that the commission's preference is to keep the house and barn as two distinct structures to preserve the historic original look of both structures. So they- uh, uh, Frank, I'll, I'll read that letter into the record. Okay. So, and then Mr. Krause, I know he's on the, um, on the Zoom and if he wants to add to that, you know, he'll have an op opportunity to do so. Okay, all right. Um, at this point, uh, um, without getting into the specifics of the requirements on the, uh, to get a variance, I, I thought it'd be a good chance at this point, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to take questions with regard to what we're proposing. So the first question that I have is, when, when you filed the application, there were a number of pictures that, that you included. Yep. And the very last pictures showed some structure that had been, you know, converted into, you know, habitable space. Is that, is that the barn itself? Um, no, the last couple of pictures um, are part of the house looking okay. out towards the barn. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the plan and you can see the house, the corner of the house closest to the barn is in that corner is the bathroom which depending on which picture you're looking at, um, you can see one of them, you can see a toilet, the other one you can see a radio. Right. That door is going into a full bathroom mm -hmm. and the, and the uh, picture is being taken from within the kitchen. In the kitchen of the house looking out towards the barn? Yes. Okay. So the barn is very, very unfinished. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's uh, very rough. Are there horses in the barn? They were. <laughs> they were. <laughs> so I guess have, the next 
you know, question that, that I have is if you can just tell us, you know, what, what how, how is the house going to be converted? What are the barn rather converted? What, you know, what, what, what portions of it will be converted into, is she proposing to uh, convert into uh, habitable space, living space? Uh, both floors will be converted. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there'll be a kitchen, living area, um, bedroom, uh, full bath, and um, uh, another area where she wants to do some of her pottery work and things like that. And uh, uh, Stephanie Sylvia is uh, with us. I don't yep. know if she wants to say anything. Steph, <laughs> is that pretty much what you want to do with the barn? Exactly, just a little modest art studio with the kitchen, bathroom, living area. It's always been my dream to convert an old barn. And, you know, so it, we found this perfect house and we're just trying to get into something that I like. So, so will the Will the art studio be on one floor and the living space on another floor? No, this art studio will just be a little section of, of the upstairs. Um, just a very small little area that I'll paint in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just something I love to do. Okay, so let me ask another question then. So will the first floor be still garage space or will it be also living No, that space? would be um, a kitchen and living area. It just makes more okay. sense that way. And then what, the bedroom would be upstairs? Yeah. Okay. So we end up with one bedroom total? Oh, yeah. It's just me. I don't need more than one. Okay. <laughs> now, as far as the art studio, are you planning on doing commercial activities there, or is this just for your own? No, it's just pleasure? a hobby. I have a full-time job, so I just really okay. just love doing it, so... Dave, any other questions? Um, I guess I'll just ask if you connected the two structures, Frank, to make it one. With this, wouldn't the um, side yard setback become uh, would have to be con considered at fifteen for a variance? No, uh, it's been previous done in town um, where a uh, pre-existing non-conforming structure was too close to a side yard and was allowed to connect up and then convert the um, uh, other structure into a, um, similar to this, a second, a, a second dwelling unit within the structure. So now you, uh, it has not been required in the past. When and where was that at? The one that I know about is on uh, West Leonard Street. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that created a dimensional issue, though. Um, the um, garage at that time and, um, was 9.2 feet off of the uh, side okay. yard. So it was closer than ours. Um, and Diane, Diana has that uh, file. Uh, she can confirm that. I can. Let's see if I can figure out how to share it. Did that create a need for variance then? No, the, I looked at both files within the um, uh, Zoning Board of Appeals and uh, the Building Inspector's Office today, and there were no uh, variance or special um, uh, permits or findings required. Mm. Again, there was a gap between um, uh, a garage um, and the house. Uh, they connected it and um, um, converted the garage into a uh, an apartment, and second dwelling unit. What what year was that work done? Um, I guess nineteen ninety nine. This plan. The, so, yeah, the I plan guess. is ninety nine. I'm not sure when the work was done. Yeah. All right. But it didn't go to the zoning board for any reason, did it, or did it? It, it had previously gone to the zoning board for a number of things. The garage was originally converted uh, for use as a catering business. So it had previously been mm -hmm. on the board mm -hmm. with regard to that. And then uh, the catering business ceased. And um, yeah. And, All right. Uh, I, know, I'm, I know the one we're talking about, Val. Yeah. Okay.
Dave, anything else? Nope. Uh, Kim? Uh, no questions, thank you. Okay, uh, Kurt? Uh, no questions, pretty straightforward. Okay, Lorraine? No questions, thank you. Okay, Frank? Um, so, so again, the, the The main variance we're asking is to have a second dwelling unit so that we don't have to come service. Um, to, so we don't have to connect it, connect it. The reason for that is again, uh, we'd like to keep both uh, buildings as original as possible. Uh, connecting, connecting, connecting the two would take away from that. Um, it's also difficult uh, to connect the two to because the first floor in the house is uh, five or six steps above grade. You take five steps up to the porch, off the porch, and then you have to walk into the house. And the first floor in the garage is that ground level uh, floor. Uh, the basement within the house uh, is old stone uh, foundation uh, with um, um, not too low of a ceiling, but a low ceiling a lot of pipes and a lot of um, wires going through there. So it would be very difficult uh, to do any connection that would really connect the two buildings together. Um, as an engineering friend of mine says often, um, you can do anything. It just takes a lot of money to sometimes. And this would be very uh, expensive to try to do that. The other thing is that corner of the house, again, has a bathroom right in the corner and the kitchen. So it's not really conducive to really um, expanding there or connecting there um, at all. Um, so there's a, uh, a financial issue with regard, uh, but the, 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 the real hardship we're looking at uh, that they feel is that they'd like to keep the look of the barn and the house as two separate structures as is, and they prefer not to connect it for visual purposes. Um, but also they're running into the issue of the difficulty of um, connecting the two houses because of the elevation difference, the topography uh, with regard to the two structures um, and feel that giving this variance really wouldn't be any detrimental uh, to the zoning uh, because they, they could uh, connect the two and get a second um, dwelling unit there. So Frank, you really haven't talked about the criteria for the variance. Again, section 4.1.4, as you quoted before, provides that we only have one dwelling structure on a lot, unless otherwise expressly permitted in the bylaw. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're looking for a variance from that section. What's the basis of your position? Uh, well, um, various requirements, um, typically two prongs to it. Um, one of them, the first one is only to circumstances relating, relating to the topography of such structures. Um, and again, I'm summarizing, moving out, out. We feel the topography with regard to the two structures um, is making it um, very difficult to connect the two buildings. Again, the first floor on the uh, residence is uh, five or six steps above grade. The, um, the entrance into the barn is at grade. The residence has um, the bathroom in the exact corner of that house and then the kitchen is right there. And below it in the um, basement, which is all field stone uh, foundation is all the piping, uh, the septic, and other wiring. So in order to connect the two houses, uh, two structures, it would be very difficult um, um, to do it. Uh, so because of the topography of the structures and, and the land uh, and affecting this property in particularly, and not the zoning district in particular, that um, we meet that criteria. 
Again, the other one is a, um, a hardship, financial or otherwise. I think I've explained the financial hardship. But also the other final, uh, hardship would be uh, taking away from the historic pro perspective of these two structures. Um, again, we want to try to keep it as historical as possible. If you connect the two structures, you're taking away from that. And we strongly feel well, that's, a, that's quite a hardship. And then the third prong is desired relief uh, can be granted without substantial detriment to the public good and without uh, nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the ordinance of the bylaw. Um, we think we meet that uh, because um, um, it wouldn't really harm anything. As a matter of fact, we think by not connecting it, it would um, really go to the benefit of the zoning and the historic district. Mm -hmm. So one thing I can't quite get my head around is why you would not consider this to be a use variance. Well, um, a use variance, um, I can get my zoning book. If you're looking for what uses are allowed, you have to look under uh, section three of the zoning bylaws, the use regulations. If you look under the use regulations under G, residential, mm -hmm. uh, right in there under six, single family dwellings is allowed by right, as are two family dwellings in the R15 allowed by right. So they are allowed. However, as you have indicated, under 4.1.4, which is under Section four, which is dimensional requirements, says you only can have one dwelling per lot. In that same section, it talks about side yard and rear yard requirements. Now, if somebody wants a front yard variance, again, let's say they want to get closer than the um, 25 feet um, yard front setback, they want to put a farmer's porch on. Mm -hmm. for example, and they want to go 20 feet from the front yard. That's not called a use variance because it's under the dimensional requirements. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a dimensional requirement. One of the dimensional requirements is you only can have one uh, dwelling per lot, and therefore you can have <laughs> a... Um, a um, um, you can you know, obtain a variance by that. Um, um, but under the use area, single family dwellings, plural, are allowed. So you're saying because the table of uses, because it's saying single family dwellings, meaning plural, are you saying that that's the the, the otherwise permitted exception? To well, plural is there, so it, it, it states more than one. But I think in either case, whether it's single plural, single family dwelling would, are allowed on within the R15 zoning district. And, and if you could only have one dwelling in a zone, why would you need 4.1.4? You wouldn't need that. Now, can you repeat that, Frank? I, I sort of lost you on that. I'm sorry. If, if, if under your interpretation that under um, Table 3-1, mm -hmm. if you read it as single family dwellings, if you read that as stating that, oh, under the use regulations, you only can have one dwelling per lot, that's how you read that table. Why would you need 4.1.4? Anyone else have any other questions? No. <clears throat> Not right now. I'm sorry? 
Uh, Dave Brown, none. No questions. Okay, um, Kim, nothing. Kurt or Lorraine? No, no questions right now. Barry, I, I, I overlooked you before. Do you have any questions? No, no questions at this point. Okay. Um, why don't we do the following? Um, we'll allow for public comments or questions. And I think what I want to do first, I'll read the, um, the letter from Mr. Krause that was in the um, application package. So this is a letter that's on Tanner Foxborough Historic D District Commission stationery. The letter is dated December 20, 2020 to Stephanie Silvey, William Schernick, and Mackenzie McDermott, 15 Baker Street, Foxborough, Mass, 02035. Dear Stephanie, William, and Mackenzie, welcome to the Baker Street Historic District. Our historic district was established to preserve the architectural significance and rich character of your neighborhood. The buildings and structures need your special care and attention to preserve the uniqueness of Baker Street. I understand that you intend to establish your art studio in your barn and for Stephanie to live there. If you plan to make exterior alterations to your property, you must submit your plans and obtain a certificate of appropriateness from the, Foxborough, from the Foxborough's Historic District Commission. The commission will consider the general design, proportions, detailing, mass, arrangement, texture, and building materials used. The commission would prefer that you keep the house and barn as two distinct structures to preserve the historic original look of both structures. Historic homes often get relief from current building code. For example, hand railing, height and spacing, specifications for steps, etc. in order to maintain the historic look. In a similar manner, I hope the town of Foxborough will consider the historic value in maintaining the original look of two distinct structures and allow your living studio to remain structurally independent. Sincerely yours, Tom Krause, Chairman, Foxborough Historic District Commission. Um, Mr. Krause, you're, you're with us. Do you have anything you would like to add to that? Unmute. Unmute. You hear me now? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So not, not really. I mean, I just want to make it clear that we haven't approved anything. I mean, there's been no plans that have come before us. What we're just saying is that we would prefer that it remain as two, two, two separate buildings. That's okay. all. Okay, thank you. Anyone else from the public? Okay, I see none. Um, Ms. Silby, is there anything you want to add? Um, not at the moment. I just, I think Frank did a good job at explaining what our intentions are. Okay. Is there anyone else? None. Um, do we have any, any we other got a, uh, Bonnie, a message just popped up. I guess Trish uh, that's on the screen okay. says she's having a problem unmuting her mic. And okay, now we can. Okay. It was saying the host is not allowing participants to unmute themselves. Um, so I'm Trish Selby and this is Michael and we live next to Steph. Hi Steph. <laughs> we, can, we can almost see each other through our windows. Um, and I, I have a couple of questions about the setbacks and about, well, I have a few questions and I don't actually know who they go to. Um, so I, I did see Tom's letter originally because I also sit on the historic district. Um, and we all agree that of course the barn has always been a barn and it should look like a barn and what's going on inside of it is not the historic district's business necessarily. Mm -hmm. as long as it still looks like a barn on the outside. Um, my concern as a neighbor is that the barn happens to block the view from their house into the only private part of our backyard. We are so exposed on Baker Street, both from railroad and from Baker, that we have one tiny little L in our backyard where we can't be seen by anybody else sitting in our backyard except the barn, but the barn doesn't have anyone in it. It's a barn. And if it's converted and windows are added in that entire 
whatever 1500 square feet or so of barn turns into a house, that house is now directly looking into our backyard. And, and as you have noted, it is very close to mm -hmm. our yard. So you, you, you said you had a questions. So you said there's a 15 foot setback, but, and I just see him as Frank, but I assume Frank is their attorney. Yes. Um, okay, so their, their attorney has said that they don't need a variance to convert the barn into a house, even though it doesn't have the setback. Um, right. Let me see if I can phrase this as simply as possible. So the, the town in its zoning bylaw establishes dimensional requirements. And those dimensional requirements among others are, are how close a house can be to, to the side yard setback. And in the R15 district, it's a 15 foot setback. In other words, a house, cannot, a house or, or another structure on the property cannot be closer to its side yard than 15 feet. The house meets all the dimensional requirements, but the barn does not. The barn is only 11 feet. And the barn has been at this location, as was indicated earlier, well before the zoning bylaw took effect. So it, it's constituted as a pre-existing non-conforming use, meaning it does not conform structurally with the dimensional requirements of the bylaw. Right. But it has vested rights because it, it, it has been in that location prior to the, the existence of the bylaw itself. Yeah, so it's, it's grandfathered in. So yeah. Like As a barn. Well, it's not a living, it's not a dwelling unit. That's like mm -hmm. saying a garage is where it is. That doesn't mean it can become an ADU. Mm -hmm. um, it's grandfathered in as a structure. Yeah. Just but like a structure isn't a just, dwelling unit. As long as you can convert it to an allowed use on that lot, you have a right to do that. Now, depending on what you're doing, you could run into other issues. But for example, if you have a commercial building that's pre-existing non-conforming and you have um, office space that one um, attorneys are using, but you, the person leaves and you want to convert it to a different type of use that's allowed in that district, you can change that by right. But if you do any work to the structure, depending on the work, you then may fall into special permits, variances and things like that. But changing from one allowed use to another is, you know, um, typically allowed, but again, if you do any work on the structure, it, it, uh, you could run into some issues. Okay. Do you have any other questions? So many, but they're probably not appropriate at this stage, so. Well, you know, tonight's the night we'll be making a decision on this, at least I think we will, so. If you feel you do have any other questions, it would be appropriate to ask them tonight. Okay, so it's an ADU. Isn't there a, well, it become, uh, I, I'm jumping a few steps. I'm going to assume they don't get connected. I'm going to assume the barn is its own structure that is going to be converted in its use to a dwelling unit. So now you have two completely separate single family homes sitting on that lot. Is mm -hmm. the second one now considered an ADU or do you no. have two single family homes? No, the, the, um, in, in order to be an accessory dwelling unit, it, it, would, it would need to be connected to the main structure. So if, if they were to connect the barn, the garage to the, to the home itself, and, and meet whatever the criteria are for an accessory dwelling unit. You know, that, that, that's a possibility, but, but you would need to connect, you know, barn to house in order to, to be an accessory dwelling unit. What, what they're, they are applying for, what Ms. Ms. Sylvia is applying for is, is again, not to connect, 
but to establish a second separate dwelling unit on the property itself. That would not be considered to be an, access an accessory dwelling unit. Okay, so that becomes two single family homes Correct. on one lot. Correct. Let's assume it's built and then let's assume somewhere down the line, Steph and Billy decide to sell the house. Well, now mm -hmm. the house is. They could split the lot and sell two different homes. In, in order to split the lot into two separate lots, they would have to go before the zoning board. And there would not be enough, I don't believe enough property, uh, enough square footage on the lot at current to allow for two separate lots. But they, they can't split on their own. They would have to come to the zoning board to request a variance. And Mr. Chairman, we'd be more than amenable to a condition saying that the lot shall never be split or anything okay. to that effect. We have no problem with that. How, how do you figure um, how many cars? You'd have to figure this is needed probably parking for four cars. Okay. And how do you come up with three? No, nobody's going to visit? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant on a regular basis. Um, there's three owners here, so um, four? I mean, yeah. That and sounds... Do you have the width to do that? I'm, I'm looking at this. You know, I know the driveway's not a it's actually pretty large, to be honest. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how it would work. I don't know the dimensions, but... Um... I don't know, Dave, if you see one of the, the, the photos, you, you, there are three cars uh, side by side by side. You could easily get a fourth car, you know, in there by moving the cars around a little bit, and then you could stack them. And it's... it's um... Yeah. I, I don't think there'd be a problem. I know of other two families and more that have a lot less parking. Okay. We, we, we sort of interrupted Ms. Selby. I don't, I don't know if you have any other Sorry. questions. Uh, no, I'm good, thank you. I, I, I wanna just make you know one thing clear. Um, you know, again, in order to have an accessory dwelling unit, that unit must be part of the main house itself. And, in, and the way the bylaw currently reads is that a family member of the owner of the property must live in both, you know, house and, and the accessory unit. Exactly what's going to happen. Okay. What is being proposed here though, are two separate unconnected dwelling units. So that's not an, that's technically not an accessory dwelling unit. And again, the reason it's not is because it's among other things, not connected to the main house as, as far as what they're proposing. So in theory, what you could have is somebody who is not a family member residing in one of the two units. That's Is that happen, but <laughs> in theory, in theory, right. and sure. it could happen with a subsequent owner. Yeah. Well, in theory, you could, again, connect it, make it a two family and rent out both dwellings. Correct. Correct. You know, and if we, if we um, obtain this variance and, and have two dwelling units on the lot, an owner down the road could rent out both. Correct. To be honest, yeah. And just back to the parking, under zoning, you need uh, uh, four parking spaces per unit for a multifamily um, and one visitor space for every four units. Uh, so you really just need um, five spots for it. 
So I think there'd be more than enough area there to get five spots under the, what's required under zoning. If you just looked at the zoning requirements. No, I understand. Anybody else have any other questions? We're ready for a motion to close the public portion? I move that we close the public portion of this hearing. And that's Dave Brown making the motion. Yep. Second. Kim, second it. Barney, um, Zoom calls are required. All votes are roll call votes. Yep, yep, yep. I know that. <laughs> they did that in my introduction. Kim's on, Kim's on mute. Hang on for a second. I second. Okay, good. So a yes vote would be to close the public portion of the hearing and no vote would not to close the public portion. And I have to do it by roll call. So Dave Brown? Yes. Kim Ellen? Yes. And Barney over it, yes. Anybody want to start? Yeah, can I start? Go ahead. So what are the thoughts about uh, common ownership to keep it within one? I think if, if they have it as two separate dwellings, then you have two separate owners that it could be, which mm -hmm. I guess is similar to uh, convert it to condos, let's say, if it was housed in one building. So you could do that. If it was in one building, you could convert it to condos. One owns the first floor, one owns the second floor, that kind of thing for a, a two family. But these are separated from each other on the same lot. And I'm with you with the idea that uh, we're really granting a use variance. I, I'm not too sure we can do that, but um, but if we do, uh, you know, I, 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 nobody knows what the future brings, but this would enable them to be able to sell that other barn uh, to anybody, you know? So I don't know what the implications would be down the line if that were to happen. If we did put conditional that uh, this would expire you know, upon, uh, you know, uh, the sale, let's say, so it's not in the same ownership, common ownership of the family, then it goes back to a barn or not recognized as a, a separate dwelling unit, mm -hmm. a dwelling. I don't know, but it's just food for thought as to which way to, to go with it, you know. Mm -hmm. I just feel that, uh, you know, a developer to come in and propose to put two buildings on one lot would be a no answer. The answer would be no. Mm -hmm. And then how would we get around that? What would that developer want to do? What would, you know, he would be told or she, uh, we can't put two buildings on the one lot. I understand uh, semantics with the word dwellings versus dwelling. I think the intent there is a single dwelling, uh, no different than multiples and, you know, dwellings and how many we can have of those. And so I, I really think that section is geared towards this is for a single family and then also two family instead of, you know, most people would refer to it as families. Mm -hmm. Not really intentionally getting into plural. I think it's really about one family, single family, you know, and, yep. and you know, on, on that end of things. So, um, you know, that, and uh, again, maybe it's not provided in the bylaw. Maybe it's something to go warrant article of the future. Maybe something to add in there as, uh, you know, Bonnie, you and I have talked about what I had in Brookline where we had conversions that you could do it and enabled you. And, and it's written in there that you, as long as all the front yard, side yard and everything met, whether it was the existing building or whatever you were converting, if it met it, you were okay. If it didn't meet it, well, then of course you'd have to go to the board, but it was for a special permit, not for variance. You know, uh, so I, I don't see the provision here that allows special permit. That's why we're talking about variance and, and I don't agree with the uh, topography uh, issue, I, but that's another, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I think that, um, it's a precedence that we're setting. We're getting a wave of people that are coming in from Boston because of the coronavirus. Uh, and we're gonna start to get more and more of these, these kinds of uh, uh, people that wanna move into our town. 
and create more density, which is essentially what you're doing here. Uh, these people, from what I understand, that live there uh, are not uh, people that have been there, you know, for many, many years. They're relatively new uh, owners of the building. So uh, what's to say that they buy this lot, they do it, we set the precedence, and they buy another lot, they do it again and again. You know, who, who knows if that's what uh, they have a business of. They could be, uh, maybe not, but it, uh, could we deny it? No, because... This is America. Buy it on the lot. Do it again. You know that, right? Okay. So let let me um, unless somebody else wants to go next, let me go. Um, you know the fact that we say single family dwellings, um, I, I think is just a product of who, whoever wrote those particular words in the uh, table of use. I agree. You know, under the same use group, we have accessory apartment singular. Right. Um, Assisted living facility, singular, multiple multifamily dwellings, plural, two family dwelling, singular. So I don't think that is dispositive of, of, of any any of the issues. You know, I think as the, the board well knows, we've taken great care whenever we've had permit requests for oversized garages to ensure that they're not going to be used for residential purposes. Correct. And, you know, again, that in part is because of section, you know, 414. Um, but I think it's also a recognition on our part that we want to make certain that there's no potential use for those structures for residential purposes. And as a consequence, we've added a number of conditions when we've approved any kind of permit of that nature, um, right. prohibiting it. I, I, going back to section 414 itself, and the specific words, you know, unless otherwise, you know, permitted. And what I want to point out is that if I can find it. That's what I'm saying. I don't find any other area that. Hold, hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Section 9671 of the bylaw explicitly provides that more than one dwelling structure may be located on a lot within the CPOD. That has to do with the Chestnut Pace and over, Overlay District. And I think that's the kind of exception to the restriction in 4.1.4 that the planning board in the town meeting is looking for. And not that a word is used, you know, plurally in the, um, in the table of uses. Dave, you wanna go next? Uh... I'm trying to catch up with that paragraph you just cited. Yeah, uh, 9.6.7.1. It's under the uh, Chestnut Pace and Overlay District. Oh, okay, yeah. So you that, but that area, that section was written for that, create that district. Right, but again, I, I think that's the specific wording that it, you know would 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 be the the exception to the one dwelling you know, per, per uh, lot requirement. I agree. The specific wording that the bylaw is looking for. It's allowed that one specific part of town. Right, yeah, yeah it was written for that. Right, yeah. not allowed in other Project, parts, yeah. all parts, it's allowed in that one part of town. No yeah. different than an overlay district would be, you know, unique to other parts of town that sure. are not. Well, I, you know, I tend to agree that, you know, uh, with Bonnie and, and, uh, and I guess you, Barry, as well, uh, that this is a, a, you know, a use kind of a variance. And I understand what Frank's saying, but I, you know, with the word in and the plural and the singular and all that. You can try. You can try. It's a garage. It's there to, well, I guess it wasn't built to be a garage back in the 1850s, but it's the closest thing to uh, what it is or was, you know? Sure. It was a carriage house, I guess, probably. It's a garage. So I would, uh, yeah, I agree with Bonnie and you. Uh, Kim? So I, I do have just a couple of things. The first, I really do want the applicants 
to understand we're not just thinking about this for you, as has been said, we're really thinking about this as setting a precedent for the whole town. So every time we do something like this, it doesn't matter what it is. One of the first things that's on our mind is uh, what does this do for us if we're if we're setting a precedent. Um, so the thing I keep coming back to is for. 1.4 only one residence per lot then I go to 10.2.23 and I'm wondering if we're approving this are we nullifying the town's intention in the bylaws for one residence per lot now if this is something that the town is interested in revisiting if this is something you know, the, the town could really decide this could be a great way for all, all these different reasons that we would want to do something, then to have town meeting vote on this is one thing. As we approach very clearly, for me anyway, getting away from one residence per lot on 4.1.4, 4, it feels like something that three people in a town shouldn't decide if that this sort of a thing should be more of an entire town meeting decision. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So that's, and, if you know, town meeting I, said yes, then that's a whole different ball of wax. Mm -hmm. And I agree with that. You know, we've had yep. cases before where, you know, the solution has been that the applicants are some group will change the bylaw and that's fine. We're here to interpret the bylaw and if they change the bylaw so that we would interpret it differently, then so be it, not a problem. Right. Yep. Kim, anything else? No. no. Okay, um, Kurt, let me, let me go to Kurt first. Sure. Um, well, I think Kim did a really good job articulating the same and exact as, she, as she always does. As she always does. Right, exactly. <laughs> and so I, I'm in, I'm in really aligned with what she had just said uh, a moment ago. I also uh, wanted to uh, think. That, I, w I wanted to say that I don't think the grade change between the garage and the house is something that would be. Um, something that was, you couldn't overcome. I mean, I, I just, it, it's, I've seen a lot worse really? conditions where you were trying to mate up two historic structures together and it happens pretty routinely. So uh, I don't see that as a uh, hardship. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lorraine. Oh, I, I agree with, um, I think Kim's explanation also. When I was looking at 4.1.4, you know, that would have been my question. Am I missing it being stated, expressly stated somewhere else in the, in the bylaws that this is this can be permitted and I'm not hearing it that. Yeah, yeah the, the only place, you know, I looked and the only place I could find was the, um, you know, again, the Chestnut Payson overlay district, um, you know, wording. I mean, there may be others, but I couldn't find anything. Yeah, okay, thank that you. That might be what Frank was referring to when he said there are others. I don't know. Yeah, could be. So, unless there's something else, I guess a motion would be in order. So, uh, Dave Brown, I would move that we not grant the requested variance. Kim, second? Second. So, a yes vote would be to not grant the variance. And I got to do a roll call again. Um, Dave Brown? Yes. Kim Mellon? Yes. And Barnett over it? Yes. So, Frank, you know that there's a right to appeal. Um, and obviously, you have the right to, you know, to connect the two, two structures. And, you know, we can obviously talk about that if that becomes, you know, something to, to do. As you, you've indicated, and I don't think anybody disagrees. Um, two family structures are allowed by right in the uh, in the R15 district. Yes, yeah, that's correct. 
So um, I haven't talked to my clients yet, uh, but I don't think an appeal is in the works. I think uh, the connection will probably be done. Mm -hmm. They do want two family there. Again, the, the, the real gist of it is um, we want to do something to keep the look of the historic district. Yeah. You know, um, and since this is a negative um, response, uh, they'll go forward with doing the connection. And I think the historic commission will now understand that they've done all they can, mm -hmm. to try to keep it separate and uh, just move on from there. And as we've indicated previously, the town has allowed in similar circumstances with uh, garages closer to the side yard for the connection to be had and the conversion to occur to a two family uh, without any findings or permits. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we can all work together with regard to that. Yeah, I think, I think on, on that, you know, I've, I've given that some thought, you know, haven't done any you know, research on that. And it's certainly, you know, when, when the time comes, you know, you and, and Barry and I can discuss that just to, you know, to be clear on that. You know, let, let, let me say as well, um, and, and I'm partly responding to, to, to Frank and, and to you know, Ms. Sylvie and also to Tom Krause. Um, you know, I, I was a history major in college and, and I started going, working on a uh, doctoral degree in history. So I have an abiding sense and, and, and a love for, you know, for, for history itself. And that includes historical architecture. And I realized that it's, it's important to, to maintain as much as we can you know, as far as, um, as, as far as homes that are, that are historical in this community. Um, un unfortunately, or maybe it's fortunate, but you know, the, the zoning board is required to review the, the zoning bylaw and make a decision on, on the basis of the zoning bylaw. So I don't want you to take it that we're rejecting any historical notions and any notions of aesthetics. It's just that our decision was based on what the zoning bylaw does, does not allow. And we made what we feel is the most appropriate decision under the circumstances. So there's nothing negative towards the historical commission, nothing negative in our decision towards any, any concept of maintaining historical you know, notions in town and historical aesthetics. It's just a decision that was made on the basis of the zoning bylaw. And I agree with that, what Bonnie said. So that being it, um, I think we're done as far as the public hearing. Frank, don't go away because we need you for another matter. Okay. So I think the next item on the agenda is the minutes from our last meeting, which Diana sent out a couple days ago. Anybody have any questions? Or comments? No. Oh. So again, we're no. gonna do go through the roll call on a motion and a vote. I move we approve the minutes as written. Second. Okay, and actually on this one, all five of us can vote. So, but again, I gotta do my roll call. Dave Brown? Yes. Kim Ellen? Yes. Kurt Yegian? Yes. And Lorraine Bro. Yes. Okay, thank you. So the next item is a letter that I think that I know that Diana had sent to to the board from uh, Media Partners. Um, as you may recall, we approved earlier this year the or earlier in 2020, I should say, a uh, static billboard for an entity called Metro Vision LLC, and the letter that we received earlier this month indicates that they've consolidated, consolidated their projects into another entity called Media Partners MRV LLC. Um, I spoke with Frank a little bit about this. Frank, I asked you to see what you can find out about the status of the two companies. I know that the Secretary of State's records still list them as separate business entities. But what else were you able to find? Uh, to be honest with you, Barney, I wasn't able to connect with them. We played a little phone tag. Okay. Um, but my understanding is, is he transferred um, everything from uh, Metro into the new entity. Mm -hmm. And he had um, some other 
similar entities that he transferred into that new entity. Now, the fact that the Secretary of State still lists as, as yep. an ongoing entity doesn't mean that it, it has anything in it. You know, mm -hmm. his indication to me was, this, you know, um, that entity doesn't exist, discloses or whatever, um, which as you know, sometimes yep. the owners don't realize what they have to do to close uh, yeah. entities. Sometimes people don't even close it and the state just does it automatically after a number of years of non-filings. So he's um, uh, transferred um, this billboard and um, other assets from other entities into that new um, mm -hmm. entity and his partners from, I'm assuming the other entities are now partners in this new um, corporation. So that's why there are uh, different um, managers also listed from the other one. Yeah. Um, and the reason we're requesting it is that in the decision, it says whenever there's a transfer of the ownership of the, um, uh, of the billboard, or in this case, just assigns the, the rights to it, that um, the board has to be notified and uh, approve it. My understanding always was is that was done for the purposes of the bond mm -hmm. that in the event in 20 years, it's transferred or sold to somebody else. You wanna take a, uh, another look at the bond to see if it's enough to uh, take it down if that ever occurs. And if at that time you ask for more of a bond, uh, but it's more of a procedural thing just to check to make sure that your, your, your bond value is there. Now they haven't even put up their bond yet because they haven't right. filed for the building permit. They're still in the process of filing with the state. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Barry knows, uh, we've had three different building commissioners sign the application with the state uh, because of the um, uh, pandemic and the executive order uh, by the governor. The, um, the billboard authority for the state uh, has not gotten to uh, their applications. Uh, the first one uh, bill signed, they never even looked at. The second one Mark signed, um, I don't know how far along they got, but uh, the signature from the town is only good for, it's either 60 or 90 days, I can't remember mm -hmm. off the top of my head. It's 90 days, yeah. Is it 90 days? And I then you're so, required yeah. to get the signature again from mm -hmm. uh, the town. Uh, for whatever reason. So, so, so Barry, no building permit. Um, no, no. no. Yeah. So, so I guess the, the, the question that, that we have to decide is. I'm sorry, Bonnie. Are you, are you asking me, was there a building permit issued for that? For, for Metro Vision. Yeah, I found that Mark Dupel had issued a permit and did not, we did not uh, gather the bond. For, the, for building, building? The, the permit was issued for it without the state approval yet. Um, I, I don't think I, have, building, I don't think a building permit has been issued. That was my understanding because they don't even have the approval from the state yet, and that's why we had to get asked, Mark signed the application. There's a permit in the system, Mark Dupel, uh, which Barney, I think you and I discussed. I was talking to you about how it was to swap out to LED. We're talking about the same no, that, one. That, 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 that was Lamar. That, oh, I'm sorry. One. I'm sorry. Yeah. You're, you're right. You're right. My yeah, mistake. That, yep. that, that's, that's another issue we got to. That's a different one. Sorry. Yep. Yep. You're right. That's right. Yep. So, so there's, there's been nothing done. No. Statewide or, or as far as your office relative to, uh, to mm -hmm. Metro Vision. Okay. No, that's correct. Um, so I, I guess the ultimate decision that we have to make is whether in, in order to, to allow for media partners to now be the entity that's of record, so to speak, do we need to have a, um, another hearing to modify that or just something in writing to, uh, to authorize it? I, I think it would be sufficient just to have something in writing to authorize it. Um, but something in writing and I'll figure out what to do, but it's something I think that the Dave Kim and I would need to, um, would need to sign. But there's also an error. I noticed in the um, in, in the in the decision itself, um, condition number eight says advertising on the proposed electric side of adult entertainment facilities and businesses is prohibited. That should be advertising on the proposed billboard. 
So I'd probably want to correct that. And we'll take the that. original, Barney. You'll take the original? Yeah. <laughs> it says electronic. <laughs> yeah. Proposed electronic sign, yeah, not that, electric. That, 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 that's when I when I moved it over from one. Um, yeah, I was going to say, who made that error? I, hey. I wonder. That that was that's my computer. It's you know when I hit cut and <laughs> to, do, to do what it's supposed that's to do. The same computer I have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I probably want to correct. I probably want to correct that, but I think it'll be sufficient. You know, if the board agrees, we don't have to take a vote on it. But if right. the consensus is oh. just a yeah. something in writing, that's a clerical. To, uh, Mistake. You know, to, to, yeah, you know, right. to authorize that and to require that you know again all the conditions other the conditions will apply to the new entity and that and that would include obviously you know the uh, the bond itself when mm -hmm. uh, when they get to that point sounds good okay so why don't i do that I'll, I'll come up with something frank you can let them know that's what we're going to do and i'll put something in writing that you know as i said the um I think Dave, Kim, and I were the ones who signed the, the initial decision that the three of us will sign as well. That, we'll that's fine, them. because the, the reason for it is once you, they file the building permit, it's going to be under the new entity. Yeah. They're going to want it to agree up with something. Yeah. So, so just to bring the board in, into some of the communication that I've had with um, Barry and Diana recently, um, I had, after receiving the letter, I had asked Diana to see if, if a bond was on uh, on file with the uh, treasurer's office. And I think the the answer that Diana got back was they didn't know what she was talking about. So I prepared a list of all the decisions that, that we've issued where we have required a bond and sent that off to um, to Barry you know, to look into. And as Barry just indicated, the, the Lamar advertising one, where we allowed the an existing static billboard to be converted to, or at least one side to be converted to electronic, there, there's no bond that's on. Uh, there is a building permit, but there's no bond. And the question I have is, are we missing something on some of the other ones as well? I got a feel we are, because yeah. I don't remember discussing bonds on any of these uh, billboards and, and whatnot on Route One. Yep. That, Maybe I we think, have, but I just new territory. I'm thinking. Well, again, it's 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 a um, it's a requirement of the signed bylaw, and in accordance with that, it's wording that we've issued that we right. you know added you know to each one of those decisions. So you would figure they're just doing it if they've read the bylaw. Um, no, that I would be frank on many of them, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, no, no. But there's got to be a, the problem is there's got to be a mechanism yeah. whereby they're not going to get, you know, if this was a house, you wouldn't get the occupancy yeah. right, without putting it up. Uh, there's got to be some mechanism for someone to ring a bell going, oh, we can't give you that until you give yeah. us the bond. But it yeah. should be in the decision. It should be one of your conditions that's been well, recorded. It, it, it is. In, in, in each of the, I think there were eight. Mm -hmm. um, eight. Eight that I listed in, in yeah. each one of those, it's listed as a condition. It's, so again, it's in the signed bylaw and it's listed as a condition in each one of yeah. those cases. I, I would think I, I would think you would require the bond when you issue the building permit. Yeah, it should you, say traditionally Brookline would say that prior to issuance of the permit, these would be the things that you'd have to have a uh, you know demonstration to show evidence that that has been recorded. The registry of deeds is the first thing, and the second thing would be in this case. Uh, evidence showing of the bond, and you need the bond mm -hmm. prior to issuing the permit. So that should be one of your conditions just added in there. Yeah, with your like, a, like a checklist. Yeah, that's right. Or that's what you have in it. Yep, you have it. You could put it as the first one or whatever. Is, you know, because that well, would it, be it, better. It, it is listed as a condition. I understand. Not, is it is it listed as a condition? Saying yes. prior to the issuance of a permit. No, no, it's not listed as, as a condition of, of prior issuance of the permit. It's just listed as a condition. I'll, I'll just read, read you the wording. Um, yeah, I'm so saying this, to is add on, on, this is again on the Metrovision decision. Yep. Metrovision, in accordance with side, signed by law section 213 3E 11, mm -hmm. shall establish a bond or other financial surety with the town of Foxborough Treasurer in the amount of $20,000 yep. toward payment of the cost of future removal of the proposed billboard in the event of its abandonment. Right now, when it, when I, I I spoke with Bill Kaspara and he said that what he had done in the past, and I hope he he actually had done this, was requiring the bond to be submitted at the time that he issued the building permit. It should be, and and like I say in Brookline, what 
I'm familiar with is in that condition for the decision mm -hmm. from the Board of Appeals in the condition, it would specifically say prior to the issuance of a building permit, you've got to have this bond. No different mm -hmm. than any other, right? And plus you have to yeah. show everything that this has been recorded at the Registry of Deeds. Yeah, we, we don't require we, we don't require any sign decisions to be recorded with the registry. Oh, I have to go. I thought it, did, they don't have to go through the ZBA. No, well, they, it goes to the ZBA. The ZBA has authority on on the matters that you don't have authority on. But yeah, yeah, but, yeah. There's, but there's no. It's not part of the zoning bylaw, so there's no requirement for registry recording on signs. Okay. All right. Well, again, then I would just put it in there as one of your conditions that your condition is prior to the issuance of the permit, and that uh, condition, those that that your list of of uh, uh, from your decision should be brought or rather uploaded because nowadays mm -hmm. we're online building permits, it should mm -hmm. be uploaded as a prerequisite to, you know, the billboards. Yeah. I, I think, you know, I, I think we're, we're tapped out as far as total billboards. Um, there, there may be conversions in the future, such as on the Lamar one. And, and that's a, a good point. I'll just try to remember the next time we, we have that kind of situation is to, <laughs> is to add that wording, you know, at, yeah. at the time of, of issuance of a building permit. Yeah, one way to gain control. Yeah. So again, I, I'll, I'll just come up with something in writing. We'll sign it. Frank, you know, I will send it to you and to McClary and and hopefully um, hopefully they'll be able to get before the OAB at some point. That'll be fine. You know, it's just so that Barry sees that change. So when they file for the application, uh, permit, yep. you know, there's no issues. And I'll make yep. sure they come in with a check. Okay. Yeah, well, they can oh, wake it up. They can upload it all part of the permit process. They've all online. There you go. Can't, trying to keep Corona out of the town hall. <laughs> Stay at home. <laughs> all right. What do we got next? Um, the annual report submission that I sent out to everybody. Does anybody have any questions, comments, changes? Look good. Good night, everyone. Good night, Frank. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Any so, uh, you know, you, you always come up with a way to keep it as long as the prior year. What are you going to do every year where we have no applicants? It's, it, 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 it's actually longer than in, than in prior years. And that, that's because of the uh, rotation of building commissioners. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's, about a, it's about a paragraph longer. I, I, I made every effort to uh, increase it. Um. One other thing that I have, um, I, I got an email a couple of weeks ago from, um, actually I got two emails from Jeff Lovely relative to the Ponset Heights Avenue uh, case that we had. Um, that, that's the one where they wanted to demolish the existing structure and create a new one or construct a new one. And they had some uh, neighborhood opposition. Um, the first email, which was back in, I think November or December, he just expressed appreciation, you know, for, for our efforts on behalf of his client. The second email I got, which was about a week ago, we, oh, sorry, about two weeks ago, he indicated that they had been working on the floor plan. I guess nothing has been presented to Barry as of yet, but they've been working on the floor, floor plan. They're going to recenter the garage. There's going to be an entrance to the house through the garage. And also there's going to be an entrance to the house on the easterly side of the property. He also indicated that because of, you know, some of the changes they were making or some of the, you know, finalization they were working through as far as the floor plan, the uh, total square footage of the property would be about less than 50 feet. I think it was like 49 feet, 49 square feet greater than, than what we had approved and what we had established in one of the conditions. So I don't think there's anything we can do. When I indicated to Jeff, there's really nothing we can do relative to the, or need to do relative to the garage and the entrances because there was nothing that we imposed relative to that. But as far as the increase in habitable square area, because we had imposed a condition, he would have to come back to us for a modification. Now, what he thought they would do would be to, again, rework the floor plan to, to reduce it to the to what we had approved. but. We'll see what happens. We, we, we may see them again. Uh, any other business? Anything on the agenda for next month so far? 
Um, I have, I spoke to one guy um, about a garage um, in a front yard setback, I believe. So he's working on that. Not a big garage, just a setback, huh? Nope, just a uh, garage addition, they said. Oh. It's attached. Okay. Heard any more Coney Island pictures? No, we haven't gone out there yet, but as soon as we do, uh, I'll bring back some pictures and uh, some hot dogs and buns for everybody. Yeah. 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 I'm not going to forget that. <laughs> yeah, we could meet on the common and consume them, right? I'll be yeah, great idea. Great so maybe, we should go to, all that. maybe we should go down to Coney Island with them. <laughs> yeah, okay, come on down. <laughs> so, so what, are you replacing all the signs there, or...? Yeah, well, the signs are falling off. They're going to replace themselves pretty soon. So, uh, they're, they're, so they have to figure out a way to adhere these signs to the building and keep it looking basically exactly how it does right now. That's what they're going through. So I have one question before we go, and you're going to probably get a kick out of this. I'd like to know how I can mute myself and get my little red mic to show up. So if you oh. go to... Kim must, is an expert at it. So, so if you go to participants. Oh, God. So I'm going to hit this. On the, t on the top? Yeah. Do you see yourself? We see where it says David's iPad. Can you, if you press on, on the uh, mic? Oh. Did it happen? No. Hold on for a second. I can do it. Maybe. No. I no there he is. You should be able to mute his on the lower left, maybe. Well, he's muted now. Yeah. Now he can't unmute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now he's okay. back. <laughs> I'm all set for the next time we do this. Yeah. It could be next <laughs> month, huh? <laughs> yeah, I was tell telling Dave today that I think it was was it yesterday, Diana? We we did the, the walkthrough. Yeah. So Diana. Um, was able to arrange with Mike Weber to have Frank and, and I on to figure out how to do this. And, um, you know, I, I didn't see anybody with raised hands on my, my screen. No. So, I don't see that as an option. I thought it was just the chat is where you could ask a question. I don't, I don't see a raised. Raise. It's under, on the, if you look on the bottom, Lorraine, there's a thing yeah. called reactions. Yeah. Oh, there. If you click okay. on that, the raised hand is in there. Mm. Oh. But most people click on the chat and it pops up. Yeah. Huh. A little easier. So I'm seeing on my reactions, I'm seeing applause. Kurt's oh. looking at a thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is what I got. I look at mine, I, I think I can see the reflection <laughs> of the uh, overhead lights in my background here on the hutch. Is that what it looks like? You see yeah. the light? Yeah. So I need to, work, you know, we got to work on this, you know, <laughs> give my lights a little next time. <laughs> we'll be good. So, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I, I decided that I, I wanted to do this by Zoom or my, my wife told me I got to do this by Zoom. <laughs> um, and, and I, you know, mentioned it to, um, to Dave. And, and at that point in time, Dave said, well, he had no problem with being, you know, being in, you know, in town hall. And I said, okay, if, if I have problems, with um you know with my ipad and in, in dealing with it you know perhaps dave could actually chair the chair the meeting then the next day i get an email from dave and he said you know i thought about it and i, and I want to do it on on zoom as well and that's when i contacted i think lorraine i ran into you one yeah, day yeah. when i was walking so then i contacted lorraine and kim and 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 kurt two days later i got an email and lorraine you would have gotten i think the same email from right. mike johns and barry got the email saying that um They've decided to um, have all meetings until you know further notice, yeah. completely by yeah. um, by Zoom. So I guess the first one was last week with the planning board, and the selectmen did it a couple of nights ago. And where the, you know, where the third. So at least for the next several months, I guess until everybody is successfully vaccinated, mm. um, this is how we're going to do it. And Lorraine's already been vaccinated. Yeah, I get my second shot a week from Friday. Great. Hey yeah, for you. And I'm waiting. I'm hoping to get it in early February because of my health. I've been told I would be somewhat in that first wave of 
people. Mm -hmm. So bring it on, you know. <clears throat> you know what happened to us? So uh, we I'll just share. We uh, we had a friend over who we felt very comfortable with. We she brought over. We take out lunches and all that. And then a week later, she's got COVID. Oh my God! Uh, so uh, both Camilla and I had to go get tested, and we did fine. But it was like, oh uh, man, you know, I don't. I just, I'm almost at the finish line, you know, from getting vaccinated. Let's get me there. Uh, so, I know. So anyhow, so I think tonight went okay. We'll you know, hopefully get a little bit better. I thought it went great, Bonnie. Really it did. I, really I, I, good. I, yeah, good and, job. You know, I don't know how it'd be with a big audience, but you know, we normally don't draw yeah. big audiences either. So, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I have to think that that the Hots and Heights one where we had you know several people standing up and um, oh yeah, that probably that would have been, been difficult. Yeah. yeah, that would have been mm -hmm. difficult. Yeah. Um, you know, hopefully before we get a comprehensive permit, we'll be able to get back into town hall. Oh, oh hey, we were at that 10%, man. It seems like we're closed for business, aren't we? No, not necessarily. Yeah, I don't know. Anyhow, um, anybody have anything else? I'm good. We might as well allow Diana and, and Mike to go home. Um, when we do a motion to adjourn, and I got to do again a roll call vote. And okay. Diana, I you, you've got you've to indicate the roll calls in the minutes, I think. Correct? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. I move that we close the meeting of the zone board. I second the motion. Okay. Uh, Dave Brown? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, Kim Mellon? Yes. Kurt Yegian? Yes. And Lorraine Brew? Yes. Okay. Good seeing everybody. I'll see you all in person. Take care. Yep. Bye. Bye.